Let's love Jesus, everybody. Let's love Him, Thy kingdom. Come on, let's put a shout with that hand clap. Let's put a shout with it. Give him some high praise this morning. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Sing it with me. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless. And strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we with ache the ocean feel? And were the skies a parchment made And every star on earth a queer And every man a scribe by trade To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry Nor could the scroll contain the whole Though stretched from sky to sky Sing it with me O oh, love of God How rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. I have to say thank you to Brother Cox. made me cry what you're at home is what you really are amen I want to make certain thank you that I preface my remarks today by saying that the opinions expressed in this message <laughs> do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the UPCI the ALJC, BOTT, POA, POBC, or Gina Dean. <laughs> and I want to say further that if you're not here today, I'm not preaching to you. And I know this is a big platform, but I don't have any subliminal messages to get to anybody. I come to BOTT every year to get a good spiritual bath, and I always go home much cleaner in my spirit. 
Now, I don't plan on saying anything controversial, but I do have your attention now. <laughs> so you better not go to sleep or take a long bathroom break, because you might miss it. I want to say something. Uh, it's such an honor to be asked to speak in this pulpit. I guess, what did you call it, a privilege and a pressure? I don't even know how that goes together. How can it be a privilege if it's a pressure? But at any rate, all of you guys out there that aspire to speak here or at any other big meeting as far as that goes, unless you can preach with the passion and fiery anointing of Anthony Mangan, who has more cribs than you have corn, And unless you can preach with the unmatched intellect and wordsmith Mike Williams, or unless you can preach with the power, the passion, and the precision backed up with the powerful, prevailing, punctuating prayer like Wayne Huntley. I can't believe you didn't get that. Unless you have the deep revelatory inside of a Jeff Arnold or the blatant honesty and transparency of Terry Schock, and unless you have 70 years of experience of preaching people out of hell and into the altar like Queen Vesta Mangan, <clears throat> she preached me out of hell one night, literally. <laughs> I never did get over that, and I'm thankful for it. Well, if you can't do all of that, all I can say, if you want to get up here, you're crazy. <laughs> Speaking between Terry Shock and Vesta Mangan made me feel like a slice of bologna between two pieces of wheat bread. So I know what you're thinking about right now. What are you doing up there? Well, that's a good question. It's a real good question. I think I found the answer in one of Solomon's Proverbs. He said, money answereth all things. And the fine people I pastored have given liberally and generously to every offering in our movement. And as we found out, Pastor Shock, a man's gift makes room for himself. And he wasn't talking about whether or not you could sing good. It's a bribe, brother. And I will tell you that I found giving will get you some nice perks. I'm not known for turning any of them down. But I'm not sure I consider speaking here today a perk. <clears throat> Notwithstanding, even though we have, as a church, given with much joy... I don't know if God thinks we've given a lot or not because he kind of uses a different way of measuring our giving. He tends to look at what we have left over, doesn't he? There is a bivocational church planner in our state by the name of Henry Ferrara. He is a painter. He started a church in Abita Springs and told me last year that his congregation is probably large enough now to support him. But he said, if I went full time, we couldn't give to missions. So I'm going to keep working. And so you thought I was a good giver. I was at a banquet for the top givers at General Conference. 
And I was sitting by a pastor from Mississippi, and I was enjoying my conversation with him, and I supposed that he was there because he was in the top per capita giving. So in my suit coat pocket, I had a little slip of paper that had listed the top 20 givers. And, and without him knowing what I was doing, I pulled it out and checked it. Oops. I asked him how many he had in his congregation. He said around 100, and I pulled out my phone and did a little calculation. And if we even came close to comparing what his church gave per capita, POBC would have given well over a million dollars. So I'm not sure about all of that. I don't know how all that's going to work out. I just know I'm glad that I can give and that I have a heart that wants to look beyond the four walls of our church and the city limit signs of our city, and today's message is not about missions. Last year during, because of the times, with the exception of the first night, I was here for Brother Mangan's message, Brother Cook. Stan Cook came over and he said, are you not feeling well? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling all right. I don't need to be here. I need to be home with my dad. Dad was on his deathbed. I got up the next morning and drove to Bentonville. And so I was able, due to the benevolence of Mangan Shock and Company, me and my dad sat by his bedside, little hospital bed in his room, and we watched much of Because of the Times on my iPad. Here he was slightly inclined on the hospital bed that hospice had set up in he and mom's little bedroom. Mike Williams was preaching last year on Wednesday night. Dad asked me, Jerry, how did that man get so smart? I don't have a clue. Later when Brother Mangan was preaching or running one of the services, Pastor Mangan, I still remember my dad holding up two fingers and with a voice that could be heard more on the other side than on this side. He said, Jerry, can you believe that man called me two times and prayed for me? Two times, he said, again, and held up those fingers. He said, with all those people he has to pastor, that big church and this big meeting, he called me two times, and he said he called your mom and prayed for her over the phone. What dad would find out before he passed, that he wasn't only calling dad, mom, he was calling me and my other brothers, other members of the family. And... and this is not preliminary remarks I'm preaching right now. I get a little confused by all this ranching and shepherding stuff. Ranchers usually raise cows, and I'm not interested in a herd. As Jesus never talked about a rancher. These great churches were built by shepherds. And I probably made some of you mad when I said that, but I would suggest to you that before you try ranching, you ought to learn how to be a shepherd. And that means you better put your hand on some people's lives, and especially when they're hurting, because you can't dele get, delegate everything out in this world. A few weeks after that, my father passed with me and Johnny and Mark and Dan and mother and other family members gathered around his bed just like he would have loved it. We respected Dad so much we wouldn't let a backhoe bury him. We covered him up ourselves on that cold winter day, and we sang when the redeemed are gathering in. You see, Daddy was a 100% disabled war veteran, but we had strict orders. Don't play taps at my funeral. Play Reveille. We laid to rest that cold day, perhaps the most kingdom-minded man I've ever known. 
like that patriarch Jacob. Dad was weary after 92 years. He had the opportunity to bless all of his kids and nearly all of his grandkids before he passed. He called for the hospice bed to be brought to the house. And like Jacob of old, he gathered his feet up into the bed and he passed. And on this particular night, just around New Year last year, we had communion at Dad's house. I said, Dad, you want to do communion? He said, yeah. I didn't know they had just done it a few days before. So Johnny and Deb and their kids and my son, Ryan, and Charity, we were there, and we all knelt down in front of Dad and asked him to bless us. I didn't know then his life would end in just a few short weeks. We buried Daddy on Thursday, and on Saturday, we buried another of the most kingdom-minded men I ever knew. He was a major influencer in my life, Brother James Kilgore. The church he led for so long, Life Tabernacle, paved the way and showed us how to do it. Thirty plus years ago, 1,500 strong in a church that was given $300,000 a year to missions. And a man who died without a retirement, kingdom minded. And I will mention both later in my message today. My father moved into the assisted living home. He soon found out the administrator was a backslider. And Shane told me himself how that dad rode his little scooter down into his room and said, Shane, God told me to pray for you today. He said, well, Mr. Dean, I'll, when I get time, I'll, I'll come by your room. He said, no. God told me today. So that night when I called Dad, he said, Well, old Shane was laying in the floor talking in tongues today. I want to read you something. If you'll indulge me from Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1 through 7. This is, this is the backslid preacher when he wrote his book after he had messed his life all up. And he's telling everybody else how to get it done now. But he's bemoaning his old age. And I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation because it makes a whole lot more sense. That's what Brother Terry Shock said. Right? Some things in here don't make sense. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say, Life is not pleasant anymore. Remember Him before the light of the sun, moon, stars is dim to your old eyes. Some of you long-timers can jump in and say amen anytime you want. Rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember him before your legs. The guards of your house start to tremble, and for your shoulders the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants. Stop grinding before your eyes. The women looking through the windows see dimly. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds. Can I get a witness? And then all their sounds grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper. And a caperberry... I could put in parentheses there and give you a name of a prescription drug, but I'm not going to do that. And the caperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. I just sent 500 young men into depression right there.
Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now when you're young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. The seventh verse said, For then the dust will return to earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now, I call this today confession of an aging preacher, not an old preacher, an aging preacher. Although I have had a few frightening experiences in the last year, I am learning some things. There's not a lot I've really enjoyed about getting old. You know, you can only pull so many white eyebrows out until you have no eyebrows left. (laughs) I rightly name this the confessions. You get old, it's like, You use your arms more to get up than your legs. And you never get up without having to pull up your britches. Am I right? And then they come out with these britches you can't even pull up. How are we supposed to navigate in that kind of world? And another thing about getting old, we still have to polish our shoes. You didn't get that either, did you? I went to the nursing home this last year to be at a, at a birthday party of a man in a church who's in the nursing home who turned 90 years old. And so they have this little section roped off for the guests of the party. And I'm sitting here, and here comes this lady riding up in her motorized wheelchair. She goes past the barricade, rolls up to me, sticks her hand out, and introduces herself to me. I said, I'm I'm Jerry Dean, pleased to meet you. She said, I've been living here for eight years, and I want to tell you, you're going to love it here. That's a true story. Why is that so funny? (laughs) As you age, I would trust that each of us and all of us will consider what the wise man said. The majority consensus of both the rabbis and the Christian theologians is that David wrote Psalm 24 to be sung on the occasion of returning the ark from the house of Obed-Edom back to Jerusalem. Psalm 24 and 3 says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Now I've got this clean hands figured out, I think. But I'm worried about this pure heart. And I want that blessing. He shall receive the blessing of the Lord. I want that blessing. Solomon, in this same book, bemoans the fact that he said, folly is set in great dignity in chapter 10, verse 6. He said, the rich sit in low place, and I've seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. I found it interesting that only one generation away from a man being hidden away as a shepherd boy 
forgotten and unknown. And David himself called himself the servant that God took from the sheepfolds. If there was ever a servant who started riding like a prince, it was David. But Solomon, who grew up, was so much given to him and reigned in a kingdom that never knew war, that knew only peace. Well, look what that brought him. Thank God Paul went to prison. Well, we might have half of the epistles that we read. But for a man who grew up with a silver spoon in his life, he didn't understand. It was, it was folly to him. And I, I think I understand what he is saying. But I want us as a generation to realize that David's choice of a man who's going to get the blessing was Jacob, the heel grabber, the man who went after it, who decided i got to have more than my intellect and my ingenuity and my cunning ways. I've got to have something from God. My brother's coming after me with 400 servants, and they weren't coming to have a birthday party. They were coming with vengeance in their mind. And so with that in mind, he crosses the brook, and he gets hold of a man. The Bible called him a man. It said he wrestled with a man in Jacob 32 and 24. I noted that in the English Standard Version, man is capitalized. It's the uppercase because we understand it was not just a man that he was wrestling with. You come to this place where you realize you don't have enough sense and you can't have enough planning meetings and you can't have enough create, uh, recreating this and that, that you need the blessing. And if you have the blessing, you don't need anything else. When you have God's favor, you don't need anything else. You don't need everybody to like you if God likes you. Joseph didn't need everybody to like him. He only needed one man to like him, and that's the king. Now, we all want the favor of our brethren, but there may come a time in our life when we're going to have to say, Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord right now. Is there anybody here that wants the blessing? What are we willing to do to get it? Clean hands and a pure heart. I think I got that clean hands pretty much figured out. You know, you just you quit lying. You don't steal. You don't kill anybody. You don't, you don't fellowship with Jack Daniels. You just... You know, that's clean hands. That's the things we can see. It's that business in here that, that Brother Terry Schock was talking about a moment ago. It worries me, especially since the prophet Jeremiah said, the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? I want to see God. Do you want to see God? Well, in one sound bite, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Because I wonder what drives me. I wonder what my motives are. I wonder why I want to give. I wonder why I want to build Bible schools around the world. We have a new goal. We announced it Sunday morning to the church. I, I like the British Empire. I don't want the sun to go down on a training center somewhere in the world that the Pentecostals of Bossier have funded. That's my heartbeat. But why am I wanting to do that? Is it really for his kingdom? Or do I like the perks? that come from this. So I search my heart. I look in my heart. I look deep inside, and I know I need God's help in order to do this. Now, you're going to misunderstand a thing or two that I say here before I get through with this in just a little bit. But please understand where I came from. Please understand the men who shaped my life. Thinking of my friend Mike Williams, 
who told me when his daddy walked out of the bedroom in the morning, he came out with his shirt and tie on, marching into his office, headed to the prayer room, heading to get on his knees before God, men that shaped my life. Men like J.T. Pugh, I'm not going to live in the past forever today, but we need to get a hold of something here. I'm preaching about a pure heart. We need a generation of seekers. If you're going to seek him, if you want to get up on that hill, you better have clean hands and you better have a pure heart. You may get your blessing, Jacob. You may get your blessing, but there's going to come a time when you're going to need more than your daddy's blessing. You're going to need God's help. Give the Lord a hand clap right now. Would you do that? Come on, let's do better than that just a moment. The Spirit of the Lord is going to talk to us. It's going to move us. Does anybody here want that blessing? I got to believe. You know, the Bible said David heard. They came and told him, the Lord is blessing everything Obed-Edom has. He's got the blessing on his life. And the king said, hey, I got to get that blessing here in Jerusalem. I need it in my family. I need it in my home. I need it here. Let's go get it. And so they went on a fast, didn't they? They sanctified themselves, didn't they? That's why he's saying, who's going to get the blessing of the Lord? He's got clean hands. He's got a pure heart. He has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitful. He shall receive the blessing of the Lord. I was reading uh, on Twitter. I don't do Facebook either. I got a problem at home I got to deal with because some Facebook post. I want to challenge you to do what I challenged our church to do. Go home and get on your Facebook and delete anything and everything that doesn't glorify God. Now I'll bend over and let you kick me in the seat of britches, all right? I don't really care what you're eating. I don't care about your new purse. I do care about your grandkids because I can't get on that. I'll be preaching to myself. If it don't glorify God, we ought to get rid of it. If it doesn't exalt the name of Jesus, we ought to get rid of it. Well, I didn't get a whole lot of response from that, but that's okay. Whatever made us think everybody in the world wants to know what we're having for supper? How do you know I'm not on a fast? <laughs> I didn't have that in my notes, but it felt real good saying it. I accidentally retweeted, like when I first got on Twitter, somebody said something nice about me, and I retweeted a couple, accidentally. I promise. <laughs> I'm texting my son, Ryan. I said, how do I delete a tweet? I'll show you how. Some of you need to find out. Brother Shock said it, and you didn't get mad at him. So I'm, somebody posted a tweet about a letter to the editor of Newsweek magazine. Apparently, I didn't read the original article, but the article was to discredit the infallibility, the historical record and all that of the Bible. Did anybody else read that? Somebody tweeted, and so I read this article. It, was, it took me about 15 minutes, and I was scanning it because I have ADD. Don't send me a long email. Yeah, I grew up with OCD. My wife has diagnosed me with ADD. So that pretty much guarantees I'll never be a TFT. <laughs> she said, ask your doctor about ADD. Can he give you some medicine? So I did. Dr. Wilson looked at me and he said, no. I said, why not? He said, we ain't tested it on people your age. 
I've been getting hit up on the side of the head all year long by this stuff. So I start reading this brilliant response. Now, I, I don't remember who wrote it, but it was a brilliant response, and the, and, the, and the tweet said that Newsweek actually reprinted this beautiful response. Well, this guy is throwing things out about the Bible, you know, like Codex 3 and papyrus and bulrushes and clay tablets and I'm like, oh, God, I'm dumb. <laughs> no, seriously. I'm like, I got to go back to school. I got to do like Brother Colthorpe. I got to be a perpetual student. How am I ever going to get anything done for God? Well, the Lord helped me a little bit. He reminded me of the verse in Acts 4 and 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. <laughs> and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Hey! When you got a blind man, I mean a lame man standing beside you, jumping up and down, they don't care if you know how many codexes there were out there. You just got a man saying, I don't know. All I know is I've been laying at the gate all my life. Well, how'd you get that? We've been with Jesus. We've been with Jesus. We're a generation of seekers. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. I tell you what happens when you've been with Jesus. You stand before the Supreme Court of your nation, and they say, don't speak in that name. You say, oh, ought we to obey God or man? Yeah. When you've been with Jesus, they give you your last meal. And you're waiting to get your head rolled the next morning. And you decide, hey, I might as well go to sleep. I'll be in glory tomorrow. That's what happens when you've been with Jesus. When, when, when you've been with Jesus, they don't frighten you with the words. Uh, and they don't care what you look like or what you got going. It don't matter anymore. You've been with the Lord. Come here, Carlton. Carlton, a neighboring pastor who's a friend, a dear friend of ours from Bossier City. He, uh, he's a church planner. He started a new church in, uh, I'm going to embarrass him here. He started a new church in, uh, in uh, Stockwell. No, he started in Starbucks. Yeah. We've been friends for almost as long as I've been in Bossier. And he's, uh, he was a Assembly God preacher. He's got, a, he's got an independent church now in Stockwell Elementary, and they're meeting. I think they have around 100 people. He wheels into my office one day about a year ago, and he said, do you have five minutes? I said, sure. We got to talk. I said, what's going on? He said, I'm struggling. Well, what are you struggling with? I'm struggling with something I've been believing all my life. Really? What? The Godhead. What? What's your problem with your Godhead? He said, this word persons. I, I don't get it. It's not in the Bible, is it? I'm like, no, I tried to tell you that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So I gave him a book. He wanted some material. I gave him Bill Davis's book, The One That's Made Simple, which is an incredible little book. And he texted me about, about three days later, and he said, I need an appointment with you. I need an appointment with you. He said, I'm ready to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Hey. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. You know what? He will tell you that he considers the day he was baptized in Jesus' name the greatest day of his life. He texted me yesterday and said, I'm baptizing. How many of you baptizing Sunday? He's baptizing four in the name of Jesus. That's the blessing I want. And while he's sitting in the baptistry, 
Brother Shannon and Brother Ryan are there, and, and we're waiting on Ryan to go get his camera, and he's sitting in the baptistry, and the tears are rolling down his face. He said, when I get out of my car, I feel the Holy Ghost in the parking lot. And he said, I know why. He said, I know why. It's your apostolic lifestyle. Brethren, hold on. I want the blessing, but I got to have pure hands, uh, clean hands, and I got to have a pure heart. I've, I've decided if, if God gives me an advance notice like my brother and my dad, I'm going to preach my own funeral. Oh, I can do that. I can, we can get a video, and they can edit it and put a, little, put a little cute background music in there and do the whole thing. We, I know how you whitewash the tombs. My brother owns a funeral home. He said he's never buried a sinner. <laughs> That's true. Everybody goes to heaven when you die, you know. I might like Johnny talk. Johnny and my brothers, that'd be cool. He'd get up there and snot around and cry. He'd tell you all the funny things that happened. It'd be neat, you know. Might let Ryan say something. I don't want my good-looking son-in-law talking. That's just a joke. I don't want my wife talking. She knows too much. <laughs> Gina got up there and got to being honest. You wouldn't be called me Bishop. You'd just be called him old Jerry. <laughs> she she knows about that heart stuff, see. She hears when you're fussing at home, you know. I, I surprise myself sometimes when I get that deadly poison in my tongue. My criticism, my cynicism that comes out as you get older, that stuff worries me because I don't see it as being a pure heart. And I try to get a grip on it and I try to get a handle on it. And sometimes some of you do something ignorant and I got to go pray through again. You know, I read one time that if you knew everything your friends said about you, you wouldn't have any friends. If somebody gets up at a conference and says something everybody else is thinking, we throw them under the bus. If you're not here, I'm not preaching to you. Paul knew his departure was at hand. He just summed it up in one little sound bite, didn't he? I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. And I finished my course. I just figured out a few years ago, I don't need to be like anybody else. I don't know what God's called you to do. I just got to finish my course. And we're at that stage, Johnny. Unless we live to be 124, we're way past halfway in our life. We're on that downhill slope. I know it. And this stuff starts sinking in when you realize you're fixing to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to judge not just what you said, but the thoughts in your heart. And God knows what our motives are, and he knows why we want to build a bigger church. Is it to extend his kingdom? Is it to exalt the name of Jesus? What is our motive all about? Would somebody shout hallelujah right now? You know, I think, I think, if, if we as a fellowship, and I know we have other groups here, but you jump on board with me a minute, all right? If we as a fellowship would get our hearts pure and start seeking after God, you know, and you, your days are numbered. Brother Shannon shared this. I said, can I use that at, because of the times last Sunday? The Japanese eat very little fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans. The Mexicans eat a lot of fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans. The Chinese drink very little red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans. The Italians drink a lot of red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans. 
The Germans drink a lot of beer and eat a lot of sausage and fats and suffer fewer heart attacks than the Americans. Conclusion, if you speak English, that's apparently what kills you. Young men, please, I don't know if I have any influence in your life. I don't have a voice in your life. But I wish you'd listen to that old backslid preacher for a minute. He said, you better remember him in the days of thy youth. When you've got energy, when you've got strength, when your shoulders are not stooping, when you can stand up without grabbing a hold of something, you better get it in your heart, and you better get a pure heart, and you better get your eyes on his kingdom. And if we have his kingdom... Clap your hands to Jesus. I'm finishing up. I want to know him. Yeah, that's how Paul summed it up. I want to know him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Oh. I want to see that lamb. I want to see that lion that morphs into a lamb. I want to be there. Do you want to be there? Do you want to be there when they start singing worthy? is the lamb. I got to promise you, there's only one pulpit in that place. There's only one throne there and everybody else is singing in unison. Worthy is the lamb. I read that verse the other day and it was with a godly envy that I envied the writer John who said, we have seen him with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. I envied him, the miracle worker, the transformer of lives, the healer of leprosy, the one who opened the blinded eyes and walked on the water and turned the water into wine. I want to see him. I want to see him. I want to see him. I thank God for his blood today. Without it, I wouldn't have had a chance. Neither would you have had a chance. But I also want his blessing in my life because I want my life to count for something. You know, I was thinking, and I, I, I got so many ignorant weaknesses. It's just crazy. You guys just make me feel so dumb. My wife would call that false humility. And there's a little touch of it in there. You know, I've often said I'm really not I'm kind of for limited terms. And I've been over men's ministry for a quarter of a century. I guess I was thinking 25-year limited term. When the truth is, I kind of enjoy the perks. Hey, I got a free, I got a reserve parking place account meeting, brother. That's worth something in Louisiana. You could have known, Brother Kilgore, if you're too young to have not had the chance to cross the path. I'm sorry for you. These are the men who made us what we are. I had the unique privilege, Johnny and I both, of attending Texas Bible College when he was the president. I can't imagine the responsibility, the job, the hours, the time that that precious man of God had to put in. We used to have a break right before the chapel service, and... We'd all go into chapel right straight from the ping pong tables. And we'd file in and sit down. And Brother Kilgore would just walk up to the pulpit. And he'd start singing, oh, love of God, how rich and pure. And you can get these little prickly hairs, you know. These little goosebumps coming up on you. The next thing you know, you're wiping away the tears. 
I doubt Brother Kilgore ever really understood anything about a planning meeting or a creative team, and I don't know what he had and didn't have. I just know he had a church that was so strong that many, if not most of us, would envy that size of a church today who he had born. Every year in January, the whole month was given to revival for year after year after year. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just, it's just like when he, when he got up there and he started singing, here's, here's what it was. You just knew, you knew he'd been with Jesus. That's it. You couldn't help it, and that's why the goosebumps and the feeling and, and all of that came. And I, I text Brother Gurley this morning asked him if he could tell me how many preachers came out from under his ministry, and he said 150. And I'm not against planning meetings, and God knows I need to have more. But, guys, make sure you have more prayer meetings than you have planning meetings. <laughs> when it takes you four hours to program your lights, and you pray 10 minutes for God's blessing. You're not trying to impress God. You're trying to impress man. Let me tell you, friend, he wakes up every morning to a universe that's still growing. You're not going to impress him with your smart lights. You might impress your buddies, but you're not impressing God. But I'll tell you what impress God is when you become a Jacob and you say, I want that blessing. I want that blessing. I want that blessing. I, I, I'm not good enough anymore, God. I trick, I trick my brother out of the birthright. I trick my daddy out of the blessing, but I'm in trouble. You're going to be in trouble one day. Don't you be like old Ahaz who paid off against the advice of the old prophet, didn't he? He paid off the king of Assyria to protect him from his enemies, a contrary to everything in the Bible. He took the money out of the church to do it. And he went over there to thank him. And the Bible said he saw an altar over there. He took the pattern of it and the fashion of it and sent it back to Jerijah, the high priest. And if he had been a priest worth his salt, he would have threw it in the fireplace. By the time the king got home, he had the new altar there. I don't have time to read the verses, but it's there. He said, take that old brazen altar. That old altar that's seen the blood of millions of lambs. You put it over on the north side. We're going to kind of stick it out of the way. And you bring that new altar in here. Let's set it up. And he said, don't get rid of the old altar. It'll be for me to inquire of the Lord. Because I may face something someday this new altar won't handle. get out of their lights here but I, I, he got through building his new altar and the Bible said he took that lever it was so big the Bible called it a sea he took it off those bronze bulls and he built a pavement of stones he made it easily accessible to all the people yeah he lowered the standard that's usually what happens. We, we probably at home in Bossier, we probably do baptize some people too quickly before they bring forth any fruit, meat for repentance. We baptized one dude, and I don't, he, first time at church, and he crawled up out of the baptistry and said, well, I knew that wasn't going to do any good. I think he's a drug addict and he thought he was going to get high. You see what old King Ahaz didn't know, we found out in the book of Hebrews, God said, you be sure, Moses, you build it just like I tell you because there's something like it in heaven. It's a shadow of something. Have you go ahead, you go ahead and go to your little cute church conference and you figure out how you're going to have these celebration Sundays and you're going to, that's, that's what happens. You get rid of that at first altar and the next thing you're lowering down that labor of baptism. You, you didn't learn that out of the pattern. There are no delayed baptisms in the Bible. Yeah, but it might get this one here and that one there. Now I'm thinking of my old dad when they, I, I, they FaceTimed him on my iPad and he's laying there on that bed. 
he can hardly talk. He's laying on that bed, and I'm they're saying, Hey Gramps, how you doing? They're grandkids and kids, and how you doing? We don't want to say hi. My old daddy's raising that little hand saying, Acts 238. Preach Acts 238. Preach Acts 238. My daddy had several scars in his body. Three of them he took home from World War II. The last one was a shell he took three days before the war in Europe ended. It blew out his ankle. A sniper caught him as he dove into a ditch from a barn. The sniper was hit up in a barn. So my dad walked with a limp, kind of like old Jacob. But he had another scar you couldn't see. It handicapped him. It drove him to his knees. He got it at a Brush Arbor meeting when he kept a vow to God. If you'll let me live. Drove him to his knees at 5 o'clock every morning. He called on God. And then a little garage closet he pulled out of the hand of God what we now call the gift of faith. He wouldn't have called it anything, but God gave me a gift to lay hands on people, and they received the Holy Ghost. Two weeks before he died, he said, Jerry, I, I lost count of how many people I baptized, and so I'm speaking in tongues under the water. He didn't call them to do nothing. He just laid his little two fingers on their head, and they start speaking in tongues. Well, that won't get you much, will it? Well, come up here and look at this Bible. He did this in three Bibles. That's, that's the people he baptized in Jesus' name the last decade of his life. It's 892. I think some of you would take that, wouldn't you? I'm out of time. Stand with me. He used to... He used to just aggravate me to death. He'd get up and he never finished a sermon. He wrote his sermons out in a spiral notebook. He never finished. He didn't believe in preaching over 30 minutes, so he'd be act at me today. He'd get up and get people to laughing for 20 minutes and tell jokes and funny, and they'd all hoot and holler and carry on, talk about what a great message it was. And he'd have an altar call and two or three to get the Holy Ghost, and he'd take them back and baptize them. And I'm like, this ain't right. So I went up there and I got on my knees in front of him about a year or two ago. I don't know how long ago. And I said, Daddy, give me that gift. Give me that gift, Daddy. So I walked. When I got my car to go home, I'm thinking, boy, I wonder if I got that gift. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, yeah, you want it the cheap way, don't you, son? Oh, love of God, how rich and pure. 